Yeah. And in case we haven't met, as always, hi, my name is Paul. You, got, you guys are just nice to me. You make me feel good. Thank you. You know, speaking of feeling good, I'm going to give a shout out to our church family joining online, sending some hearts your way, a little love coming your way. You got to push that little heart button and send some back. That'd be great. If you're a, uh, a first time visitor with us here at Faithy Church, I want to extend a warm welcome to you today. For about the last month or so, we've been going through a sermon series titled Saul of Tarsus. Titled that because, well, that's who we've been talking about, a guy named Saul of Tarsus, otherwise known as the Apostle Paul, who through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote half of the books in the New Testament. Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. And he also wrote a book that we're going to begin going verse by verse through starting next Sunday, the book of Philippians. He wrote that to the church in Philippi, and that's where we're going to spend some time today in Philippi. And so if you would, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, the fifth book in the New Testament. Always encourage you to bring your Bibles to church. There's just something about having the written Word of God in our hands, the very breath of God in our hands. And so if you did happen to forget your Bible, that's okay. We've got some in the seats underneath, uh, underneath the seats in front of you. But we'll be in Acts chapter 16. And today we wrap up our Saul of Tarsus series. And now as we do, I've got a question for you. It's for me. It's for all of us. And here's the question. Whose name are you trusting in? Who, who, whose name are you trusting in? Jesus. There we go. I heard a couple answers to that. Now, I suppose if you didn't say that out loud, you may be sitting there thinking, okay, Polly, come on. It's church. It's Sunday morning. The answer is Jesus, right? His name is at the top of your worship guide. I mean, if you ever nodded off and fell asleep during church and you just happen to wake up and somebody's asking you a question, you'd probably just say, um, Jesus is the answer and you'd be in good shape, right? Let me ask you a little different way. Whose name are you trusting in, not just on Sunday morning? Whose name are you trusting in, you know, the rest of the week? Whose name are you trusting in Monday through Saturday? Whose name are you trusting in when you're at work, when you're at school, when you're at home alone? Whose name are you trusting in? Like, we're going to have fun. This is going to be good. Whose name are you trusting in when life is great? Whose name are you trusting in when life is not so great? You see, one of the biggest critiques that people outside of the church have of the church and Christians is this. The Christians they know don't live out what they say on Sunday morning. So whose name are you trusting in Monday through Saturday? Is it the name of Jesus or is it some other name? You're trusting in your own name, family name. Maybe you're trusting more in the name of a friend, your spouse, Boyfriend, girlfriend. Maybe you're trusting more in the name of the, the, the employer that you work for. Maybe you're trusting more in the name of that little piece of paper that's folded up in your back pocket that says, in God we trust on it. You know the dollar bill. Uh, maybe we're trusting more in that than the name of Jesus. Do we exemplify the kingdom of God by trusting in the name of Jesus outside of these four walls? Because there's only one name that we ultimately can trust. There's only one name that has power. There's power in the name of Jesus. Would you say that with me? There's power in the name of Jesus. Do we live that way? That's what we're dealing with today in Acts chapter 16. And I think this text is going to push us a little bit. It's going to make us feel a little uncomfortable. And I'm good with that. Because I need it. I think we all do. So before we jump in, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. We know you are among us. We desperately need to hear from you today as your people. So speak to us through your word and through your spirit. Jesus, this is your church, your king. We love you. You are so good to us. And it's in your powerful, mighty name, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you were here last weekend, you know that Pastor Lonnie gave a great message. If you happen to miss that, you ought to check it out. Check it out online, faithy.org. Today, we really pick up right where we left off last week because we're going to continue with the Apostle Paul's second missionary journey. And he's joined by three other fellows. He's with Silas, Timothy, 
And now Luke has joined the group. Luke's a physician. He's a doctor. He wrote the book of Luke, and he also wrote Acts, what we're studying today. And, and this group of guys, they've been spirit-led to a place called Philippi, like I just mentioned a few moments ago. And they're staying at a lady's house, and this lady's name is Lydia. Lydia, Lydia is a dealer in purple cloth. Most believe, and I think this is reasonable to assume, that she's wealthy, she's a good businesswoman, and the Lord opened her heart to hear the words from the Apostle Paul. She receives the gospel and she becomes a believer. So as she invites this group of four guys to her house, she really encourages them to stay there. And that's where we left off last week in verse 15. And we pick right up in 16, and we're going to go all the way through this chapter to the end of verse 40. We've got 25 verses to cover. Are you ready? All right, good. Buckle up because here we go. I'm going to do a high-level flyover of most of them, and then we'll stop and zoom in on a few. But we begin, we begin with verse 16, and we find the group of four guys. They're going to the place of prayer. And they're met by a slave woman who is demon-possessed. She meets them somewhere along the way, and this particular demon has some kind of a pro, pro... I don't know the word. Prognosticating, there we go. Ability, meaning it can predict the future. That's what's taking place. She's demon-possessed by that kind of a demon. Now, I don't know if you noticed what happened just a couple days ago. February 2nd. We do this every year. It's something called Groundhog's Day. You know what I'm talking about? The great prognosticator himself, Punxsutawney Phil, comes out of the hole. And whether he sees a shadow or not, that determines whether we're going to have six more weeks of winter. You know what I'm talking What happened on Friday? I don't even know. Spring? Okay, well, it's been spring here forever, it feels like. We could probably use a little bit more winter. But, you know, Groundhog Day, we have fun with it. It's make-believe. We laugh. I think Bill Murray made a movie in the 90s about it. It's a good time. We know it's not real. But what's taking place here in Acts 16? Oh, it's very real. Make no mistake, the spiritual world around us, just because we may not be able to see it, it's as real as what's in front of our faces. There's a battle that's being waged every day, every moment for our very souls. And sometimes we get a sneak peek into that spiritual realm, and such is the case with verse 16, here in Acts chapter 16. And this, this, this girl that's a slave, possessed by this, this demon that predicts the future through her, she's making a great deal of money for her slave owners. She's also following Paul and this group around, and she's shouting. And I can, just, I can just almost hear her voice. It's probably screechy with a demonic undertone as she shouts these words. These men are servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you the way to be saved. This continues for several days as she shouts this until finally we see in verse 18, the Apostle Paul, well, he gets annoyed. He gets so annoyed. Now, why would Paul be annoyed about that? I mean, what she's saying is true, right? I mean, you could even say what she's saying is biblical. Referring to the Lord as most high God, we see that throughout the Psalms. We see that in Daniel 5.18. So why would Paul be annoyed by that? I mean, it's like they're getting free advertising from this woman, right? But you see, the Apostle Paul and the others don't want Satan to do the advertising because eventually it's going to lead to deception. That's the enemy's goal is to deceive. Sometimes a little truth is used to really enslave people into bondage. Perhaps that's what's taking place with this demon-possessed slave girl. Sometimes a little truth is used to lead to a bunch of false teaching. Sometimes a little truth is used to ensnare people into a, a false religion. I've heard it said this way, never let hell speak truth because eventually it'll twist it. I think that's why the Apostle Paul is getting annoyed. He's ready to shut this down. He's had enough. And you know, the, the literal translation of that word annoyed is irked. Now, I asked the first service, anybody ever been irked? And about four people raised their hand. I'm like, come on. Who's been irked before? Yeah, probably all have. Well, let me show you a little example from my own life of a time where I was irked. It was one of the stores that I ran as a store manager. And we had a bird that flew into the, into the warehouse. Now, this was not an uncommon thing. It happened all the time. But the particular bird that flew in there was a magpie. It was highly annoying. It was always squawking at everybody. Um, 
it pooped all over everything. I mean, it was just gross. And most of the birds would leave, but this thing just wouldn't leave. Sometimes it would even swoop low. It freaked out the team. One of the people on the team thought the thing was possessed. <laughs> so I walk back into the stock room one day, and there's about 10, 15 team members just standing around doing nothing. They said, they're all freaked out by this bird. And I tell you what, I'm irked. I'm irked because productivity had gone out the window. Not the bird, but pro productivity had. And I, now, I happened to keep a football in the stock room because it was handy to have. Sometimes I needed to kind of boost morale, so I'd pitch it around with a team. And so as I walk back there, I'm seeing everybody stand around. I'm kind of getting irked. All of a sudden, that magpie squawked at me. And I look up, and there's that thing up in the rafters. And not only did it squawk at me, but it bounced around and turned its back to me. So I said to one of the team members, give me that football. <laughs> and so, now, the Lord did not see fit to bless me with an athletic body. And I'm okay saying that. I'm comfortable in my own skin. But on that day, <laughs> oh, he made me like Randy Johnson. Because I had that football in my hand, I loosened up my shoulders just a little bit. And I looked over my shoulder at the team and I just went like this and smiled. That football left my hand. I kid you not, it was like a bullet coming out of the end of the rifle, a perfect spiral, tight, and it hit its mark, hit the bird right in the back of the head. The bird, feathers, feathers fly everywhere. It falls to the ground, bounces twice. The thing's dead as a doornail. <laughs> if you don't know what that looks like, got a little video to show you. Check this out. You see the picture? That me. I was like Randy Johnson, the big unit himself. The only difference is I had a football in my hand throwing that thing. And it hit its mark. Well, eventually the football stops bouncing around and it rolls gently right next to the dead birdie. I pick up the football. It has a single feather on it. I blow it off. I hand it to the team. And I walk out that stock room door like this. <laughs> Hands down, the greatest athletic feat of my entire life probably always will be. And they gave me the football as a souvenir, and there it is. Eventually, I, I, I uh, moved on from that store. Brian mentioned this earlier. You can tell we like to have a little bit of fun here at Faithy. We're going to have some today as well as Fan Zone, so make sure you come to that. It's going to be a great family time. It's so cool to see so many new faces here and just be part of a church body that grows. And next weekend, as well as this weekend, are going to be great times to meet one another and get to know some new faces. And... <clears throat> We might have a few games that involve throwing the football around a little bit too. So make sure you come next weekend. All that to say this, the Apostle Paul was irked. But when he turns around and he sees the slave girl, he doesn't throw a football at her. He doesn't throw anything at her. He says this in verse 18. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. He doesn't say in the name of Paul, Silas, Timothy or Luke, he says, in the name of Jesus. And at the moment the name of Jesus is spoken, the evil spirit leaves that poor slave girl. You see, there's nothing, there's nothing magical about speaking the name of Jesus. What happens is there's a declaration of his power and authority over the forces of evil. There's a reason that the demons shudder at the name of Jesus. It's because he's alive, he's well, he's conquered death, he's conquered hell. He stands in victory over it. He's won. That is an amen. That's what's happening here. He has complete authority over the entire cosmos, that which is seen, that which is unseen. He's most high God. He's God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. And his name is Jesus. There's authority in his name. That's the first blank on your worship guide. And that's the only one I'm going to tell you. You're going to have to pay attention for the rest. There's authority in his name. That's the king we serve and follow. Be encouraged by that today. And after the spirit leaves, the slave woman, well, it's good for her, but evidently it's not so good for business. Paul performs this exorcism on this slave woman, and along the way, he also performs an exorcism on the income stream for those slave owners because all of a sudden their pocketbooks have been impacted. They don't care about the girl. They care about the money that they're making. 
interesting how sometimes it seems like money, the dollar, and the gospel oppose one another. You ever notice that? I guess there might be a reason why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not the money itself, it's the greed and selfish motives that it drives and it fuels. Well, these slave owners, they ain't happy about their loss of income. They're mad. So they drag Paul and Silas out into the street in front of the crowds. They stir up the crowd. They drag them in front of the local magistrates. They were just basically civic judges, and these magistrates order that Paul and Silas be stripped and beaten with rods. Now, to be beat with a rod in that culture, it wasn't just a single rod, a single stick. It was actually a group of rods, a group of stick, tightly bound together. And there was also, you can see a picture here, an axe head or an axe in the middle of it. The axe was removed for corporal punishment, which is what Paul and Silas were experiencing. The axe head was kept in there for capital punishment. That's my understanding, and you can get the picture. And even though it was removed, that axe head... You can bet that the beating they endured was brutal, severe, and at times could even kill the person that was being beaten. The Apostle Paul talks about being beaten with rods three times in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and this is one of those times. And what's interesting about that, you'll notice how there's a coin with that rod and axe set up, and there's also another inscription engraved in stone. You see, what that meant... For Rome, that was a symbol of their justice and judicial system. That's why it appeared on everything, including the coin. It's kind of like Our Lady Justice when she's sitting there holding the, holding the scales. You know what I'm talking about? That's the picture of the bundle of rods and the axe head. And here's what's, here's what's ironic about all this. We're going to talk more about it in just a minute. Paul and Silas, they didn't even get a trial. There's no justice being served. But yet, that's supposed to be a symbol of justice. Well, after they're beaten with that, they're thrown in prison. And the prison guard is told to make sure you guard these guys carefully and put them in the inner cell. And that's what they do. The Roman prison had a three-tier system. There was an outer court where the prisoners could get fresh air, talk to one another. There were the cells. And then there was the inner portion where Paul and Silas were kept. It was basically a big hole in the dirt floor. Bad news. Tough spot to be in. And then their feet were ordered to be put in stocks, meaning their feet would have been spread apart. The only position that they could assume was a sitting one or laying on their now freshly beaten backs. Uncomfortable, brutal, difficult. (laughs) And yet, about midnight, they probably couldn't sleep. And it's about midnight, and we see in verse 25 this, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Come on. I, I, man, I don't even know what the other prisoners are thinking. We, we're not told. Perhaps they're like not all that excited. Paul and Silas, it's midnight. Come on, guys. What are you doing praying and singing? We're trying to sleep here. But they heard the words that were coming from their mouth. They heard the words the praise, the hymns that were coming from the mouths of Paul and Silas. They weren't weren't pouting. They were praying. They weren't looking for pity. They were giving praise to God. The hole that they were shackled in now became a house of worship. And the other prisoners took note. Paul and Silas, they weren't praising the pain. They were praising the name. Their joy wasn't based on the circumstances in front of them. I don't think they were enjoying the beating and the suffering. But they found joy in the one who walks in the suffering with us. We're going to see that word joy throughout the study of Philippians over and over again. Chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says that I pray with joy always. Chapter 4, verse 4, we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And when we do, when we live like that, even when life is not so great, even when things are hard, when we find joy in the one who is with us in it, oh, the world takes note. Because that's a faith, that's a belief, that's a theology that's not based on circumstances. 
That's, that's countercultural living. That's exemplifying the kingdom of God. And it's impossible to do on our own. It's made possible through his spirit in us. That's Christ in us. Yet so often we exchange that treasure, our relationship with Jesus for lesser things, only to find no joy in the things of this world and the treasures of this world. So we must guard and protect our relationship, that treasure we have in Christ, by being in his word, spending time with him in prayer, practicing the ways of Jesus. Because when we do, we'll find that the incomparable riches we have in Christ, the joy we have in, in him, stands in no comparison to the things of this world. They all pale in comparison to him. You know, following Jesus, it's an adventure. And it's the only place following Jesus that we can find life, real life, abundant life. And yes, I know, there's twists, there's turns, there's bumps, there's major potholes in the road. You might be facing that now. But we can enjoy the ride with Jesus knowing that he's promised to always be with us. And we can trust that he gives us all that we need. You see, there's joy in his name. Won't find it anywhere else, not in the treasures of this world. There's joy in the name of Jesus and in him alone. That's the king we serve. That's the king we follow. Be encouraged by that. Well, while Paul and Silas are there praying and singing hymns to God, suddenly there's a violent earthquake, shakes the rafters of this prison cell, shakes the floor that they're on, their, their, their shackles loosen up, they're now freed. The prison doors fly open. Naturally, the prison guard wakes up at all the commotion. He sees the doors open, and logically he assumes that the prisoners have now left. They're gone. And he knows the consequence for a jail guard, a jailer. He knows what the Roman law of the land is, that he would for sure face a shameful execution. That's what happens if one prisoner escapes on their watch. So he decides to take matters into his own hands. He's about ready, just as he's about ready to perform Harry Carey on himself, run himself through with his own sword. The Apostle Paul yells out and says, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Now, I've never, I've never really thought about this till I studied it over the last couple of weeks, but that statement, we're all here. I always thought, okay, sure, Paul and Silas are there. But you know what? Every other prisoner's there too. Never thought about that before. There's other prisoners, places packed probably, and they're all there. Why did they stay? Was it the earthquake? Were they scared? Did they stay in their cells because they had a great amount of fear? Maybe Paul and Silas told them to stay and that's why they stayed? Or perhaps, and I think this could be the case, they knew something supernatural. They knew something life-changing was afoot. They heard Paul and Silas singing praises to God. They felt the earthquake. They stayed. Not a single one left. And when the prison guard saw that they all stayed, heard that they stayed, he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he asked them this question in verse 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's not talking about being saved by the Roman authorities, from the Roman authorities. He's talking about what must I do to be in right relationship before God? What must I do to find eternal salvation? Perhaps he's asking Paul and Silas because he heard the demon-possessed slave girl yelling out that these men know the way to be saved. But he's asking them that question, what he had just experienced he'll never go back to because of what he experienced to his old way of living. So he asked the question, the most important question all of us human beings can ask, what must I do to be saved? And so Paul naturally says, well, you've got to go to church. You've got to get baptized. Now he doesn't say that. Important things. We come to church to grow in our faith, to learn about Jesus. We get baptized to publicly display our faith in him. And if you weren't here last weekend, I'll mention this again, but we had 10 people get baptized. And we say thank you, Lord, for that. That's a big deal. But you know, each one of those people who were baptized last week, they knew that salvation wasn't saving them. Coming to church wasn't saving them. They understood the words of the Apostle Paul to this jailer when he said in verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's it. That's it. 
Everything else comes after that. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in his name. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in his name alone. Nothing we can do to save ourselves because it's already been done. Our job is to believe in his name. What's it mean to believe in his name? It means to believe in who Jesus is and what he came to do. He's the unique son of God. He's mighty God himself with skin on. And he came to take the punishment that was due for us. He died on the cross for the sins of mankind. And today he's in the throne room. He's at the right hand of God because he rose on the third day and he's in control. He is king. That's the gospel and it's the power of God for salvation to all who believe. That's the gospel. Believe in the name of Jesus. That's, that's it. That's a big deal. And you know, a true faith, true belief, will certainly result in a changed life. A different way of living. Such is the case with the jailer. He goes home. He takes Paul and Silas to his home. His home was probably attached to the jail, perhaps even part of it. We're told that the, j- the jailer, his whole family, they believe the gospel. They receive it. They believe in the name of Jesus. And immediately the jailer begins to clean their wounds. Changed life. He's cleaning their wounds. And immediately after that, symbolically, him and his family are washed because they're baptized. As he's washing the wounds of Paul and Silas. And then in verse 34, we see that word joy again. The jailer is full of joy because him and his household believed in God. They believed in God. You know, I bet if we asked the Apostle Paul, if he was sitting here today and we said to him, Paul, was it worth it? The suffering, the beatings, The trials, the tribulations, the imprisonment. Paul, was it worth it really? Be honest, I bet he would say without hesitation, oh yes, because God used that to bring salvation to a prisoner and his family. And you know, one day, we're going to see the Apostle Paul in heaven, and we're going to see that jailer and his family, and that's going to be a good day. That's going to be a joyous day. I can't wait. Well, after spending the night in jail, and maybe part of the night in the jailer's home, Paul and Silas are ordered to be released. The magistrates send some officers to them with the orders to release them. And check this out. Go in peace. Come on! They just got beaten in prison. And now the magistrates are saying, "Ah, go ahead, you're released. Now go in peace. And the Apostle Paul, you got to love the gloriously stubborn Apostle Paul because he says, I don't think so. Not so fast. We ain't going nowhere. You tell those magistrates, they can come to the prison and they can escort us out because we were beaten, we were in prison without a trial. And then Paul drops the bomb. This is the nuclear option, if you will, because he says, tell them that we're Roman citizens. Big, big deal. Because in the words of the Roman statesman Cicero, he said this, to bind a Roman citizen was a crime. To beat one was an abomination. The magistrates had done both to Paul and Silas. I think when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, I bet they wet themselves just a little bit. I bet they were shaking in their Roman booties because we find that they go to the prison, they escort Paul and Silas out of the prison and tell them, ask them really to leave the city. That's what happens. And I want to pause here for just a moment. Let's just think about this. Think about what's taking place. Paul, he doesn't just sit idly by and say nothing. He doesn't just go on with life. No, actually, he's informed. He knows the law. And and really, he's exercising his civic duty as a Roman citizen. You see what's happening here? Paul's operating within the structures of the Roman law and the guidelines that have been set up in that culture, in that context. And he's doing that so long as it doesn't oppose the kingdom of God. So long as it doesn't go against the kingdom of God. You see, politics has its place. Oh, yeah. 
but the gospel is eternal. And what Paul is doing isn't for his own benefit, for his own name, for his own glory. What he's doing is he's really doing this for the church, and it's brilliant. Because he's using the laws of the land to further elevate where the church is at to protect them from future mistreatment. That's what's taking place. He's using the laws of the land to help protect the church, this, this church that's being birthed in Philippi from further harassment. What the enemy meant for persecution and to destroy the church, God uses to further protect it. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God. Be encouraged by that. That's what's happening. Paul and Silas leave the prison. After that, they go back to Lydia's house, and we find this in verse 40, that they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them, then they left. They go back to the house, and you know who the brothers and sisters are at the house? Oh, this is good. It's the jailer and his family. And, and some scholars believe, and I agree with them, that the once demon-possessed slave girl is there too. And of course, there's Lydia, the owner of the home. You see, God opened her heart. She became a Christian. She opens her home, and it became a church. So next week, when we look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, we're going to see that Paul says this to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. He's talking to Lydia, the jailer, his household, and he's talking to a once demon-possessed slave girl who's been set free. Oh, this is beautiful. Welcome to the church in Philippi. That's the church. It's a vibrant reminder that nobody is beyond the gospel. Nobody is beyond the grace of God. I mean, these people are together with seemingly nothing in common according to the world's economy. Yet the name of Jesus smashes through barriers and unites us as brothers and sisters under his lordship as savior. You see, the name of Jesus transforms. There's transformation in the name of Jesus. There's transformation in his name. Apostle Paul certainly experienced that. Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus Here's a voice from heaven, and it's Jesus. And he's saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the voice goes on and says this, it's Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go. So Saul, he got up and went. Suddenly, his mission became his mission. Saul of Tarsus, who once beat and imprisoned Christians. Now we call him the Apostle Paul who's taking a beating and in prison for Christ. A man full of hate is now full of the spirit and driven by him. A man who is a zealot for the law becomes a fully surrendered disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you again, whose name are you trusting in? There's only one name with authority, only one name that gives joy, there's only one name that brings salvation, and there's only one name that transforms people, and it's the name of Jesus, because there's power in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. You might be here today and you've never experienced the power that's in the name of Jesus. You might be here with all heads bowed and eyes closed and you never experience the salvation that's in his name and perhaps God is opening your heart to the gospel. You can take that step right now. Believe, believe in the name of Jesus quietly by yourself. Simply say, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. Maybe you've been more consumed with trying to figure this out on your own, work it all out on your own, try to do the right things. Maybe you've been coming to church with a mask on. It's about a relationship. It's about Jesus as your friend, as your king. Just simply say, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. Maybe I've lived far from you. I'm sorry. I believe. I believe in you as my Savior. And then thank him for dying on the cross for your sins. Thank him for taking our place. Thank him now. Just say thank you, Jesus. And finally, just tell him you're ready to follow him as your king. You can just pray that right now. Jesus, I'm ready to follow you as my king. And if the Lord opened your heart and you received the gospel, you believed in the name of Jesus today, I just ask you, would you 
Put your hand up, make eye contact with me. I want to celebrate with you. I want to pray for you. No shame, won't make you embarrassed. But if you became a friend of Jesus today, would you just slip up your hand and make eye contact with me right now? All heads bowed, eyes closed. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Don't miss this moment. It's the most important question we'll all, ask, we'll all have to answer. What must I do to be saved? Lord, thanks that you are in the business of transforming hearts, minds, and saving souls. Jesus, thanks for making a way for us. Thanks for tearing the veil so that we can run into the throne of mercy and grace. We do that now. And God, we give you all the glory because you deserve it. Thanks for sending your spirit who dwells among us. We are privileged sons and daughters of the living God. Thank you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, would you please stand? If you're here today and you could use prayer for anything going on in your life, maybe you took that step this morning, this afternoon, believing in Jesus' name, love to, love to help you on your journey. But if you could use prayer for anything, there will be some of us up front. It's always a privilege for us to pray with you. And then once again, a reminder, don't forget to swing by the gym. They did a lot of work. It's great. But more importantly, learn about our global partners and be encouraged that we've got brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world. That's a faith builder. So make sure you swing by for that. And then also on your way out, don't forget to grab a scripture journal. We begin Philippians next week. Once again, we'll provide you those journals. And you begin to work on that this week. And on the first page are some memory verses. I encourage everybody to memorize those. It's God's word. And I'll tell you this, it is my favorite passage in all the scriptures. For years and years in the business world, this is what I had framed on my desk. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You can, be, you can begin memorizing those this week, and we're actually going to start right now before you leave. I'm going to read the first couple of verses, verses 5 through 8, and then corporately as a church family, we'll read 9, 10, and 11 before you leave, and they're going to be up on the screen. I memorized it in a different translation, so I'm going to read from our scripture journal. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's say verses 9, 10, and 11 together, and you'll see the name of Jesus in this. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Swing by Experience Missions, look forward to seeing you there, and then let's get out in the world, let's be the church, let's exemplify the kingdom of God, and show this world whose name we really trust in. Amen? Amen. Have a great week. Love you guys.